Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today I have Holly Whitaker of Tempest to me, coming to us from New York. How's your day going? It's going really well, thank you. It's Friday. It's Friday, yeah. What do you got going on this weekend in New York? Anything fun and New Yorkish? Yes, I'm going to go to a Andy Warhol photography exhibit and then some other museum. I, I actually end. I'm going to the Met Opera, and I usually do not do that much stuff. Um, you just have to catch me on a weekend where I have something that makes it sound like I have a life and I do interesting things. That sounds fun. Where's the Andy Warhol? <laughs> Oh God, I don't even know. It's at a museum in Manhattan, I believe. I don't think it's a Brooklyn museum. So cool. anyway, yeah. That'll be fun. He's an interesting character. Um, he took 17,000 photographs, I think. And, or he, I, there was some, he has some huge library of photography, which um, I'm excited to see. So anyway, yeah. Cool. So let's just jump into it. What is Tempest? Um, the, the best way that I explain what we do is we help people quit drinking. I either say I help people get sober or I help people change their relationship with alcohol. So we exist specifically as an all digital, um, like, uh, equivalent of, of either inpatient or even, uh, outpatient or intensive outpatient recovery. Um, I started it in 2014, uh, after I worked at one medical group and got sober while working there. Um, and found that there was really no place within the healthcare system that was addressing alcohol specifically and also addressing the middle ground between Alcoholics Anonymous and rehab or IOP. So there was really no for-profit, um, I would say consumer-focused, design-forward uh, thing out there that was geared towards people like me who found themselves having to navigate pretty rough territory by themselves. I mean, what is involved? What's included when I sign up for Tempest? Yeah, so we are, I mean, we, we basically say that there's three tenets of what we deliver. We give, uh, we provide content, community, and care. So we teach people how to build holistic recovery maps um, and, and basically uh, provide the um, access to different evidence-based modalities. I mean, it's a very confusing landscape and it requires, you know, every, it touches every facet of your life. So from teaching people CBT, um, all the way to teaching people how to talk to their friends and family or set boundaries, um, we provide community-based. So we have an online community as well as, um, processing groups in real life community. And then, uh, lastly, we have one-on-one -on -one accountability coaching as well as, um, Peer, uh, peer support and peer trained um, counselors. Interesting. Is the is the target customer someone who would otherwise go to rehab, or more folks who just want to curtail or, you know, reduce their drinking or or just stop drinking? Like, I mean, both. That's yeah. what's so interesting about it. I think we often have this idea that that people on one end of the spectrum need one thing, and people on another end of the spectrum need another. Um, I easily could have benefited from going away to rehab or even, you know, medical detox. Um, I ended up navigating this on my own and not missing a day of work. And so I think that it is, uh, what I have found is that it has served people with, you know, I'm drinking a couple glasses of wine every night and I feel stuck in a habit I can't break out of all the way to people that, um, have tried multiple stints in rehab and found it didn't work, it didn't stick. So we kind of actually serve um, not necessarily just like a spectrum so much as we serve uh, a specific population that feels um, they don't fit into traditional recovery. Interesting. Um, well, I don't want to sound like crass. I'm doing a dry, dry January and it sucks. I hate it. <laughs> See, we, that's, the, that's another part of it. That's also what, that is like what I would say I do really good. And um, what I've always done really well is to help people understand why it's so important to remove alcohol and also what, 
what freedom lies on the other side of it. And I do think there is a deprivation mindset that come, that we can go into this with and we can prove out to ourselves, especially if you live in like Northern California or like, there's just like, there was, I think there was so much, um, there's so much that we face when we remove alcohol that makes it seem like we're losing out. Um, and what we do really well is help people unearth the hidden, uh, hidden gems of, mm. of doing it and to really uh, redirect um, what the experience is. But I understand like, yeah, it, it, it is a, it is a, it's omnipresent, right? Like it's everywhere. Yeah. What's so hard about it? Like what sucks about it? I just, I like drinking. I really yeah. enjoy it. And I have, you know, I enjoy drinking beers, watching football with my buddies. I enjoy yeah. having bourbon at night after I put the kids to bed. And it is yeah. part of my life in multi and I, I go out sailing yeah. and we crack beers when we're sailing, right? It's part of multiple built into lives. the fabric of your life. Yeah. yeah that's right. Um but anyway, it's interesting though, the whole dry experience, it's, uh, I'm sleeping better. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's, yes, yes. I've dedicated, I mean, I left my job and dedicated my career to, to talking about this because I think there is so much, there's so much to sort through and, and how it shows up in our lives. And it seems like you're part of a trend. I mean, we've seen a couple startups and the names are escaping me, but like there's one that's doing on online uh counseling you know more um therapist counseling and you're seeing a few different you know you've got online personal trainers in a few different yeah startups. i guess this is yeah. kind of that category or wave would you say sure i mean there's a lot of direct to consumer talk spaces is, is online i think maybe what you're referring to and um talk space uh started as a direct to consumer we're direct to consumer um and then moved into a b2b to c um, we're doing the same. Um, and, and they also, there's, you know, so there's that piece of it, which is people are going outside of, um, you know, typical insurance contracts and, and acquiring healthcare themselves, paying for it out of pocket. And then you also see the use of paraprofessionals and, and that's what we've done, which is, I mean, we, um, are stacking our product with, with clinicians and, um, moving t more towards a healthcare product, but also, um, I think coming from healthcare, one of the most obvious things that I saw was, that there, you don't, the, but I knew more than my doctors about addiction. And I think that there is a much cheaper way to provide people the right interventions um, and the right navigation system. And I think you're seeing that in a lot of different um, care modalities or care delivery. Let's talk just a little more on the backstory because I think it's yeah. interesting. I mean, you've kind of given a little or hinted at it, but maybe talk about where this idea overall came from. You had your, you tell the story. Yeah, I so I worked at one medical group. I was um, I I had started there. Uh, I was like the fiftieth employee. I was I'd started there. I, I had always surrounded myself with startup culture. Um, my first job was in San Jose, and I, I I worked as an auditor, you know, at a big four accounting firm, and I worked within that startup culture. And I was always hungry for that. I worked at one medical and. I think um, I was so deeply bought into our mission of how we were changing healthcare and what we were doing and, and, and opening up access to good primary care, hospitality-based primary care. And I had this experience where I felt completely on the forefront of what was happening with Obamacare and the ACA and what we were doing to disrupt, quote unquote, um, care delivery. And then I'm this like target demographic and at you know, a 20 year relationship with alcohol and a 20 year eating disorder, like all this stuff basically came to a head. And when I turned to the system, I found I couldn't use my health insurance card. I found my doctors didn't know anything about what my, my stuff was. I found that I could go to a totally cost prohibitive rehab or I could go to AA and, you know, and, and admit alcoholism. And I think None of these things were good. And so I started to, while I was still working there, I started to essentially collect this idea of what would it actually look like if we treated this in, in the same way we treat everything else. I had this very early you know, experience where I was going to the Melt, which is a grilled cheese place in the Bay Area. And I was just, I had this moment of realizing somebody had put so much more intention into my experience of ordering and eating a grilled cheese sandwich than anybody had about my experience of recovering from addiction. Mm. And so I left in my job in 2014 because I thought I could 
do a lot better than what was being done. I thought there was a way for people to not pay out the nose. Um, there was a way to put people before the system and the system, especially in addiction recovery, you know, in healthcare in general, but in health in, in addiction, especially it comes first. It's follow the rules, go to these meetings, admit your weakness, you know, don't question. And I, there was just so much, I think that was different in my experience um, that I wanted to organize and, and leverage, um, leverage money, leverage venture capital against in order to be able to provide a better solution than what existed. And so it came from my own experience um, and so much anger around the way that the criminal justice system ends up treating addiction, the way that people assume, like the second I stopped drinking, you know, you were just talking, you're doing dry January. Well, like no one was doing dry January in 2012 and 2013. No one. And just a few years ago, it was only a few thousand people. Last year, it was 4 million people. And this year, I have no idea. I haven't looked at the numbers yet, but I guarantee it's 10x what it was last year. Hmm. So when I started to do this, there was my, I had this very unique story of why, like, why is no one talking about addiction or pre-addiction? Why aren't we talking about our relationship with alcohol? Why do 70% of us drink? Why is this a thing that we do after work with our bosses? And like, there's just so many questions I had about all of it and so many things I wanted to change about all of it. And, um, that was this, this was an outgrowth of that. I wanted to normalize sobriety, questioning alcohol. I wanted to create affordable, accessible, desirable, um, pathways to getting sober. And I wanted to do that within the, the venture capital machine. I wanted to do that within, um, with rocket fuel. Hmm, you know? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's shift gears to raising money. So I guess, uh, how much you guys raised and over how many rounds and maybe how did you get this finance in those early days? We could start. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have to date raised uh 16 point, no, sorry, $15.4 million. Um, and we've raised that over three rounds, all priced rounds. Um, my first seed round was, uh, led by slow ventures um, refactor and, uh, was a follow on. And so was female founders fund. Um, and that was a $2.3 million raise. Um, and that was, um, the hardest thing I've, I mean, it wasn't, it was after I started this in 2014, we bootstrapped all the way up until 2017 for okay. almost four years. Um, and I was profitable when I raised money. Um, so I, I didn't do this to keep the prayer going. I did it because I looked at what my projections were of how many people I could help if I was doing it on my own. And there was me and half of an employee. And I looked at what would happen, you know, how quickly I could grow and what kind of technology I could bring into this and what I could do with venture. And so I had my first conversations with uh, investors in 2000 and. 13, I sold my shares from one medical. I did a presale and sold mm. my shares. Um, and like, basically that was my retirement. And I bet on myself instead of the company I came from, even though I fully believe in one medical success, it's now worth like, I think 2.3 billion or something. Um, but I bet on myself mm -hmm. and that was huge. So we, we raised a lot of money over a period of time. It was really hard to do. Um, as it is. And it also feels, you know, like it's especially hard. You know, I'm a female founder. I'm also a founder that has a history of addiction. Um, and I think that that is something that has never, ever, you know, crossed my mind as a reason to count me out, but I definitely, you know, could, you know, make a case for why it probably has in, in some mm. cases. So. That's interesting. So talk about maybe, let's just go to that seed round, putting together that round with slow, Ventures Refactor and Female Founders Fund. Did you uh, know these folks already? How did you assemble the target list of folks who would invest in what is, I feel like now it's almost part of a trend, but maybe even a few years ago, this was more, I would call it an outlier of what VCs were looking for. Maybe, I don't know, you tell me. Yeah, it was definitely an outlier. Um, we, uh, I had a, a couple of, I had a couple of, of um, things that I think were incredibly valuable. So first I'm a really good networker. Um, I have always, um, I, I also am not afraid to ask for uh, what I need or follow up on introductions and, and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, I was put in touch with an investor from RRE in 2000 and, 
15 when I first started doing this. And um, he was somebody that, uh, his name is Steve Schlafman, who's now one of my closest friends, but I, I offered to show him our product. Um, I, they were doing a, Ari was doing a deep dive on the addiction space. I offered to show him our product and um, he became an early fan of my work, um, a huge promoter of my work. Um, I, I was introduced through him to Jeff DeFlavio, who is the founder of Groups, uh, who does opiate addiction recovery. They were also first in their field of creating affordable treatment that was not 12-step based. Mm -hmm. uh, it was MAT treatment. And um, Jeff ended up, uh, Jeff's one of my board members now. And so Jeff was uh, part of, you know, Jeff and I, and then a good friend of mine, Tim Schwartz, um, who I'd met when I worked at Collective Health. Um, you know, these three individuals helped me to put together a list of targets. They, you know, gave me warm introductions. And by that time, our, my deck was solid. I spent an entire, I mean, I, I moved home with my mom. I went, I lived in my bedroom in my mid thirties, my old childhood bedroom. And every day I sat down at my computer and worked on, you know, not just, it wasn't just a thing I did in a month. It was years of having conversations and putting together a story to help tell the story of what Tempest would be. Um, but I spent every day for, I think it was the month of July or August, 2017, piecing together a really strong deck. And with those warm introductions, a very strong deck, um, you know, and, and having had taken every single possible conversation I could take in the three years I had been running this mm -hmm. um, and being profitable, having a good model, a good projection, um, those things came together to provide a backbone for what I was doing. Um, I was a mess. I, my pitch was just awful um, <laughs> at first. And yeah. I just continued to take feedback and correct. I, was, I, I loved feedback. I loved hearing, why did you pass on this? Why did you, I didn't love it, but I loved yeah. hearing that. Like, what, tell me what I, how I could have done this better. What would have, you know, what would have made this better? And um, I was introduced to Dave Morin, who is uh, then uh, an investor at Slow, founder of Slow, uh, Slow Ventures. And, and then I, through him, met Will Quist, and um, I knew I wanted them to lead. They took a huge gamble on us. They believed in the religion of what we, they, they had religion for what we were doing. They believed mm. in what we were doing. And there was enough financial evidence to show it could work. But what they really bought was... Um, with me and, and my passion and, and also what I had already pulled off. Our NPS was almost a hundred. Our gross margin was good or, you know, like there was, it wasn't just a, a mission driven company, a good reason, you know, a good company it was also, we were doing really good stuff. Um, and we were also, we had a, not a bad business model, you know? And so, yeah. But yeah, it was it was a very long slog to get to that first round, and then we rounded it out with Refactor and with Female Founders Fund, uh, Su Chin Dong, um, and Zal Bilamoria, um, and they were. I just I found people that believed in like I found capitalists <laughs> who believed in my mission um, and me. Did you? I don't know how you would actually do this, but did you try and identify folks who had? either been through recovery or, you know, had like a personal connection to the problem you're solving. Right. I don't know how you would identify yeah. as a front, but yeah. Was that I don't of? lead with that. I think that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I ended up attracting people. Steve Schlafman is very open with his recovery. He was the first investor I met. He wouldn't have been interested in what I was doing if it wasn't personal to him. And I think that that's something that's just that that's a very typical thing. I think that they're, you know, our investors, Dave Morin was, you know, just coming off of, um, I mean, he was like on the board of Esalen and he was on a mission to cure depression. There was a lot of overlap between that. And I think, um, you know, and, and Will and Slow, they were investing in cannabis and they, like, there's just people end up having a personal connection to this. And then also those that have, like, there people come to me after they hear about it. But I mm. typically am not leading and looking for this. I mean, the thing is with addiction, you started this off by telling me about your relationship with alcohol. Like, and that's typically how it rolls. You don't, yeah. you, you know, you can throw a rock and hit 10 investors who have some relationship 
personally or relationship like or or in their own family or even friends um some sort of alcohol story does that make sense yeah it does um interesting and then i guess fast forwarding a little bit you raised the more recent round what was that your series a that was our series a we did a bridge round a priced round um we call our seed x um from our same investors that got us through to going out for our a um, I mean, our unit economics are still forming and we weren't really at an, we weren't a ready. Um, and then we were, uh, and so we went out last July and we raised our, um, our a round. Go through a little bit. Cause I think some people are either unclear or confused about like the bridge round. I mean, were you, Yeah. sometimes that means you're running out of money, but like you said, you're not ready. Well, yeah. I mean, we're always running a. out of money, right? <laughs> Talk about maybe asking this. What is a bridge round and why did you raise it? What's the right time to raise a bridge round? What does that mean? I think for me, the reason that I did it was because I knew I didn't, I knew I wanted to raise a big A. I have, I got into this pattern of always raising less. And that was what I did with my my two seed rounds. I actually went out thinking I needed 3.6 million and I ended up raising 2.3. And I, I could kick myself for that because I knew that was the amount I needed to get to the proof points to go out and raise a series A. So the bridge round was because I wasn't at the proof points yet. We were still developing our software. We were still like, we, we, we have our own stack. So we were still in the middle of developing that. Um, and even by the time I got out for my series A, I did not have again, the unit economics that I needed. I didn't have clear CAC because everything we had done was organic at that point. And so I hadn't paid for marketing. So I couldn't show a history of marketing and that was a problem. Um, there was, we were still really early on and we rebranded our product. We rebranded and did a number of things. There was just still so, so many things that weren't proven. And I think I did the bridge to buy me a minute so that I could focus again. And fundraising just is such a time suck and I hate, yeah. like I love doing it and I also hate doing it. And so <laughs> yeah, I just, I wasn't ready. And I, I mean, it's like, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I wish I hadn't done the bridge. I, I wish I'd taken a larger seed. Um, and then I wish I had taken more time. I mean, Sutian, I think Sutian told me early on, you know, always take as much money as you can. Um, and I actually, I didn't agree with that back then, but now I do agree with that. Um, and so, cause it is fundraising is, it takes so much away from your business, but, um, but yeah, the bridge round was basically to get to next proof points because I, I didn't want to do this thing of running behind. And I did again on my series A, I was still on the proof points I wanted to be at. Um, and we took, that's why we took a really large series A round so that we could get to the actual set of proof points uh, for a series B of what you're measured against. Totally. You don't have to share your exact metrics, but like, what are those proof points? And, you know, maybe for someone who's sure trying to figure this out, what, how should they think about those proof points? I do think you, yeah, I think for me, here's like what, here's what I would tell myself a few years ago, um, spend money on marketing, start to understand how much you act, like understand your levers, understand your CAC, understand your LTV, understand that ratio. Um, I think that that is incredibly important because I thought forever having free marketing was, I mean, it was great. We had, we, you know, we had used social and we hadn't spent anything on marketing, but then it had no clue whether or not if we dropped money into marketing, it would do anything. And yeah. so I think that was incredibly and hugely important. Um, gross margin is something that we've always tracked pretty closely to. Um, I think also um, just, uh, I mean, honestly, those are the big things. Those were the biggest ones, like CAC, LTV, gross margin, um, and then just also growth year over year. Um, but I think um, that was what shot me in the foot when we were raising our Series A, was mm-hmm. um, not having that specific proof point. And then also, there's other things that are not unit economics. There's also just, does your product work, especially if it's a healthcare product? We were in the middle of our, our first... Um, outcome study and our first trials and and Mm. so we now have those results back but also you know definitely important to have is does your product actually work um our conversion rate you know that was important to show um you know how many how many emails to it like there's just there was there are very things very specific i think to a consumer brand um top of funnel like and 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 all of our marketing metrics were actually the thing that people were interested in surprisingly the most 
ahead of mm-hmm. whether or not it works. Do you have an issue with, I'm just thinking about your business and I don't know your business, but do you have an issue with like churn? I mean, if some ways, if someone gets sober, don't they now? Good. I love it. Yeah. yeah. But like, but yes and no. I mean, here's the thing. Yes. Um, but also people get sober by reading my Instagram posts or reading my book or <laughs> reading our, you know, like I've, I have always wanted us to exist in such a way that we are able to leverage a paid product to create free product. And we put out a lot of free content. We have free in real life meetings. We have, you know, like we do a lot of stuff. I think, um, I, I do think that this comes back to this like lack, like I don't have a, a scarce mentality or lack mentality. I don't, I mean, I, I definitely believe in law of attraction stuff. One of the best books I ever read was, um, and I read it, uh, and I've read it a number of times, Walls Waddles, um, Think and Grow Rich, I think, or mm-hmm. no, Science, I, I can't remember. There's Napoleon Hill, but Wallace Waddles, he wrote a book and I read it occasionally, like probably once a year. But it, I mean, the whole point of it is just make sure that the value you provide is more than the value people are paying. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we've always operated from that. We get refunds when people ask for refunds. You know, we, we are consistently making sure people that are here feel like they are getting value out of it. And it means people stay with us. People stay with us. I mean, recovery is forever. So yeah. we have, we don't, I don't worry about people getting sober and then not using us. I think, well, that's amazing. Like, did somebody find our product, get sober, and then they never want to hear from us again because they don't need us? I think that that is definitely a story that happens. But if I were to build a business based off of hoping that doesn't happen, I'm building the wrong business. I'm in the wrong game. And so for me, I think I, we celebrate people getting sober and whether or not they stay with us. And then incidentally, a lot of people stay with us because that's the kind of business I want to be around. That's the kind of product I want to be engaged with. And you have the community part, which would make sense to stick around for that, right? Yeah, we do. We have an ongoing. Yeah. 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 I mean, there, yes, there's many reasons why we don't have to worry about churn, but I think the biggest is that we don't worry about it fundamentally. And that makes for a very different, you know, we're not running around freaked out about people leaving us. We're we're (laughs) consistently thinking about the magic of the people that are here. I ask, I mean, partly I'm like curious from a personal basis, because like we make software for raising money and like the more the better we do our job, the faster people raise money and then they don't need us as much. So it's kind of like the better we are at helping people, it's almost like reduces our, our LTV. (laughs) But the better you are too, also, then that also reduces your CAC. I mean, you know, like, because you have people that absolutely love what you do and they're going to be evangelists of it. That's right. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. I like it. Okay. And then, um, Interesting. And then you recently, or I don't know if it was recent, but you moved your company from San Francisco to New York. What was the catalyst for that? And what's the New York <laughs> startup scene all about? I don't know about the New York startup. I mean, I think that there is definitely, like when it comes to digital healthcare, I, I was lucky enough to go to, um, I mean, Oxion is out here. Um, and I was lucky enough to go to uh, so an event that, that one of their partners hosted recently, um, a, a menopause startup. Um, I felt like which was something I thought was so great. Like there's a lot of actual healthcare startup activity out here. Um, and so I think like Maveron's out, or not Maveron, Maven is out here. T is out here. There's, you know, there's a number. Um, but I, I think the impetus was um, all of my media. I wanted to create something that was in the San Francisco um, echo system. I think there were two things. One diversity of hire, Um, We wanted to have a workforce that I don't think existed in San Francisco. Um, And then there was also just, we were doing something that I saw as a trend that was growing and trends don't like social trends don't really move from San Francisco to New York. They move from New York to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So sobriety was something there was already a scene here of people that were engaging in alcohol free events and, and brands. And I felt it was absolutely necessary for us to be in the thick of that rather than doing it from San Francisco. But in it, and the hiring has been, our, our hiring has been magnificently um, accelerated by being in New York. Who drinks more, San Franciscans or, or New Yorkers? Is there statistics on that? <laughs> God, I would say it's even, right? I think, I mean, I, I've never, I, I have never had more alcohol 
or a more alcohol centric life. I think there's Napa and Sonoma and right. that influence. I mean, like there's all the wine all along California that influences it. Um, I would have to say, I think it's a, I, I do think people in the Bay area drink a bit more. Um, Interesting. I think that, I think that, I think New York um, has had the benefit of having also like some, I just, it's different. I, I think it's less weird to not drink here. I think it's more weird to not drink in, in the Bay Area still. Hmm, interesting. Um, very interesting. And you mentioned you're looking ahead a little bit towards a B. Are you already <laughs> starting to prepare for that? And if so, how? Never not fundraising. Um, no, I think, um, sure, we went to J.P. Morgan. We are in conversations, but I, we don't, we have enough runway to get us um we have enough runway to get us, like, like I said, we have, it's important, it was important for us to be able to not spend time fundraising for 2020 and we're not going to have to. Um, and so it's, that is nice. So we're conserving and also taking our time figuring out our next steps. I think there's such a grow, 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 get, you know, like, especially you see these ridiculous valuations and people pulling in their, you know, series B for like, 30 million. It's just, we, I don't want to be on that hamster wheel of always fundraising and thinking that my milestones are the valuation we have or the amount of money we bring in. I think our milestones are, is our product working or, you know, are, are people, are people being served as our MPS eyes, you know? So I think, um, our, our eye is on a B, but mostly right now our eye is on our business. Um, we'll obviously have to raise a, a B round, but we're trying to, not be eaten by the system. I think <laughs> venture capital is a necessary evil, but I don't think it's, I, I, I have tried to work within, I, uh, within a mind frame of, it does not dictate how we run our business to the degree that um, it can. I think our business runs our business and we use that as a, a leverage for us to do our work. Cool, great. Well, any, um... Anything uh, we haven't covered, any tips you would give your younger self if you were repeating this? One of the things you mentioned is you would have raised more in your, your earlier rounds, but any other like advice you would give your younger self who was going out to raise money? I mean, it's uh, Kate, a um, uh, writer from the, she's the CEO of Maven. She and I were on the female founders, top 100 female founders in Inc. Magazine this year. And so we were doing some video together. We were talking about this, and this isn't what I would tell my former self. This is just, I think, the best piece of advice that I have that I have heard and also given. Um, she was talking about how learning Spanish by living in Barcelona um, when it, without like having to actually learn Spanish was the hardest thing. And that persistence taught her how to raise and to run a company. And I feel like getting sober for me was that same level of, it was a hard thing to do. And it taught me persistence and perseverance. And I think that that is what the story is. I mean, it's, there's so much, there's so much, um, there's so much to do when it comes to not even just building a company, running a company, but raising. Um, and there's so much, there's so many no's, there's so many hills to climb. And I do think that is what pays the most of everything I've seen, which is just, not giving up and so you better love what it is that you're building you better love the thing that you're you know the thing that has saved me my, like time and again and given me that persistence is i would die if someone else did this i think it's really important and i you know i believe in what i do i believe yeah, in what we do fueled by the mission yeah um, what what would you say if you could boil it down what was just the hardest like the hardest part about raising money for your business? Is there any like... No, I think it was honestly creating a... Like, I think the hardest thing is taking everything that you do that you that you bleed and then putting it into a simple deck that tells the story. I think making a, a pitch deck is the hardest thing mm -hmm. that I've had. I, that to me was... It's not anymore, but it was. That first pitch deck, Yeah, I had so many versions and that first pitch deck, <laughs> when it finally told the story and somebody was like, good deck, I was like, oh, um, I think that's the hardest part. I think it's constantly overlooked. And to build a good pitch deck, I mean, that's your putting your first foot out there. That's what people look at. And to tell a story, to string it together, to, you know, and to do it in not so many words. Oh, you know, so 
I would say that was the hardest thing of this whole damn process is building the pitch deck. And then from there, you're good. You got your story, you know, rock yeah. and roll. You just keep on, you know, it's a, keep knocking on doors, talking about it, adjusting to feedback, but making that first pitch deck and that first pitch, damn. <laughs> good. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, if anyone wants to learn more, it's jointempest.com, right? That's right. And is there anything you want to promote or plug or talk about? Yeah. I just wrote a book. Um, okay. It's called Quit Like a Woman. And um, it is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's my, it's probably one of the most important things I've ever done in my life. Definitely harder than making a pitch deck. Um, uh -huh. So Quit Like a Woman. Um, you can find it on Amazon or any bookseller. Uh, it's available in the United States, in Europe, Australia. And is it your back, your personal story or is it uh, a guide guidebook or what advice book or what? Oh gosh. Um, it is a book that helps uh, put in context uh, why we're at the place we are with alcohol um, mm. uh, why treatment options um, are not appropriate um, or updated. Um, and it offers a pathway to not just quitting drinking, but recovery and healing um, that um, I think is important and necessary for the time we're living in. So it's a, it's basically a, you know, if you don't, if you don't go through our program, here's a good book that will help you figure out what it is that we do and why people get sober. I'll try to include a link in the podcast uh, cool. notes. So. I've got seven days left of dryuary and enjoy the last few days of dryuary. <laughs> it's amazing that you did that. You should feel really, really proud of yourself. It's so cool. I am. I am. It's, I was sort of begrudgingly doing it. Now I'm glad I'm doing it. And you know, just cause it does make you see how much alcohol is part of so many things, which is probably good awareness. Even if I don't continue, past it, I think it's good awareness, right? When you take yeah. it away. Um, well, if you want, we can send you a book. You're a uh, quit like a woman. I'll, yeah. I'll read it. I'll cool. read it. Yeah. My boyfriend bought it for all his buddies. I mean, it's a, it's not just for women. Um, okay. <laughs> no, that'd be great. That'd be cool. This is great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Right. Bye. Bye.